All right, grade 12s, welcome back to your video classroom. Today we're going to start with chapter 9, and specifically section 9.1, Rational Functions and Transformations. Now the good news is we've done a ton of transformations by now, and I think you'll find this relatively straightforward to do, but rational functions may be a little new to you. So as we see here, a rational function can be written in the form f of x, some function, that's a function of x, uh, is equal to some polynomial function in the numerator and some polynomial function in the denominator. So let's take a look at what happens when um, we're traveling. So if we're traveling a certain distance, you know, the amount of time that it takes to travel that distance is related to your average speed. If your speed is, oh, let's say, low, then it takes more time. And if your speed is high, for any given distance, it takes less time. So in your textbook, there's a series of investigations. And I'd like you to do 1a, 2a, and 3a. Uh, think through 1b, 2b, 3b, c, and 4. So pause the video. Now, if you looked at page 430 and 431, you would have seen that we were talking about the Trans-Canada Trail. And you were asked to complete a table of values given the time to cycle 120 kilometers of, um, of the Trans-Canada Trail, depending on your speed. And so here's what you would have seen. Um, if your speed was one kilometer an hour, it would have taken you 120 hours to get there. 10 kilometers an hour, 12 hours to get there, it's a long day and pretty slow speed. Most of you would probably be able to do 15 to 20 kilometers an hour, so it would take somewhere around 8 to 6 hours. Basically, as your speed decreases, the time required increases. But as your speed go gets higher, or as your speed increases, the time required decreases. Asks you to graph the, uh, the function that we had just created. And we have that table of values up above. And so all I did is I plotted those points. At one kilometer an hour, it took 120 hours. At two kilometers an hour, it took 60 hours. At three, it took 40. At five, it took about, what was that, 24 hours? At 20 kilometers an hour, it took about, oh, that must be about six hours. At 30 kilometers an hour, it took four. And at 40 kilometers an hour, it took three hours. And I just sketched a line through those dots. So let's take a look at how we might graph a rational function using a table of values. So we're going to work here with just a basic function, y equals 1 over x. And if we make a table of values, we'll have x values here, and we'll have y values. And let's start with some negative ones, like negative 5, uh, negative 4, negative 3, sure, 4 and 5. And so we can find the y values simply by going 1 divided by the x value. So 1 over negative 5 becomes negative 1 over 5. 1 over negative 4 is negative 1 quarter. Negative 1 third. Negative 1 half. Uh, 1 divided by negative 1 is negative 1. These are key points here. 1 divided by negative 1 half. Well, 1 divided by negative 1 half is the same as 1 times the reciprocal, that's going to give us negative 2. And in the same way, 1 divided by negative 1 quarter is going to give us negative 4. At 0, 1 divided by 0 is undefined, and that's key. So now all we need to do is plot those points. 4. And we've got this graceful curve coming through those points. And by now we know about asymptotes, and we should be able to tell that this is never actually going to touch the x or the y axis, a vertical asymptote and a horizontal asymptote. And I'll do the same things and plot the other points on the right side. And we end up with that portion of our rational function over on the right. You'll notice, I hope, that the graphs don't touch the y axis. So that means there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. And there's a horizontal asymptote on the x-axis, or at y equals 0. Those are asymptotes. If you keep that graph in mind, then we can start to analyze that rational function. And by analyze, I'm talking about these following points here. We want to identify the non-permissible values. So if I look at 1 over x, 
it's not defined when x is 0. That means my denominator, or in this case just x, can't be 0. We want to find out what the behavior is near that non-permissible value. So as x approaches 0, so as the x value gets closer to the y-axis, then the absolute value of y gets very large. Either it goes up to positive 4, or it goes down to negative, or sorry, positive, you know, high up, positive infinity, or negative infinity. The absolute value of y gets very large. That simplifies things. It doesn't, it means, you know, as x comes towards 0 from the positive side, x gets big, or y gets big. And as x goes towards 0 from the negative sign, y gets, you know, very small, negative, large values. Okay, so the absolute value gets large. And then we talk about the end behavior of the, uh, of the function. So as the absolute value of x gets large, you know, either far off to the right or far off to the left, then we can say that the y value approaches 0. We talk about the domain and range. We've been talking about that all year. So all the values of x such that x is not equal to 0 and y is not equal to 0 for range. The vertical asymptote is at x equals 0, and the horizontal asymptote is at x equals 0. Okay, fairly straightforward stuff. The only thing that's new here is this language about what the behavior is like near the non-permissible value and the end behavior. Now let's take a look at how we might sketch a rational function that has some transformations in it. So before we start with that, I should clarify for you that this is like saying y is equal to a over x minus h plus k. So we're just looking at vertical expansions with the a value, a horizontal translation and a vertical translation with the h and k values. Again, nothing too complex. So let's start with a set of axes. I encourage you to pause the video, write down the function yourself, sketch the axes out, and then come back and do this. Now with the exponential and log functions, we looked at how we can move our asymptotes over first and then draw using the a value what 6 over x would be. So we're going to start with that. We've got x minus 2 here, which means we're moving our asymptote over to the right at 2. And remember, this is like a non-permissible value. 2 doesn't work because 2 minus 2 would give me 0. That's why there's an asymptote there. Negative 3 means a vertical translation of down 3. And this actually is an asymptote. It's not one of those guidelines like I talked about in the last unit with the log function. The graphs will not cross that horizontal asymptote. If this becomes my, my, the center of my function now, then I can just talk about 6 over x. So if x is 1 unit away from my asymptote, 6 divided by 1 is 6. So I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. 6 divided by 2 is 3. Make a point. 6 divided by 3 is 2. 6 divided by 4, 5, let's say 6 divided by 6. Right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 units away. 6 divided by 6 is 1. And I get this curve. that comes close to, but will never actually touch, the asymptotes. And of course, the same thing's going to happen on the negative side. And again, I get this other curve. That comes down like that. And never actually touches the asymptote. So nothing too complicated. I'll do another one here. So I built up my axes, and uh, just for the sake of space, I made each box equal to 2 this time instead of each box equal to 1. So I'm going to have a horizontal, a vertical asymptote, I'm sorry, at x equals negative 1. Remember, this is moved back 1. So I'll draw that in. And we're going to have a horizontal asymptote at positive 5. And then we've got a function that's simply 4 over x. So over 1, up 1, 2, 3, 4. Over 2, up 1, 2, 4 divided by 2. 4 divided by 3, I won't bother, but 4 divided by 4 is 1. 4 divided by 5, 6, 7, 8 is going to be a half. Never actually touches the asymptote.
and same thing over on the left hand side. And really that's all there is to it. Now there's another function that you really do need to be able to do in this section and that's y equals 1 over x squared instead of just 1 over x. Now I believe we talked about reciprocals before as this rational function is the reciprocal of y equals x squared and there's a couple ways that you can think about that. But So the other thing we need to be able to do is graph y equals 1 over x squared instead of just 1 over x. Process is the same. Just think about what your x value is, square it, and go 1 divided by that x value squared. So, for instance, if x is 1, 1 squared is 1, and 1 over that is 1. If x is 2, 2 squared is 4, and 1 over squared is, or 1 over 4 is a quarter. If x is a half, a half squared is a quarter, and 1 divided by a quarter is 4. So I get a fairly steep graph that comes in like this and comes through here and will never actually touch the x-axis or the y-axis for that matter. The same thing happens on the back side. So you'll notice that this function stays above the x-axis. Nothing is below it. What might happen if we had 1 over x minus 2 squared plus 3? What does this minus 2 do? Well, hopefully you know, it just moves the function to the right 2. And what does the 3 do? Just moves it up 3. Now, the other type of rational function that we're going to see is when we've got two polynomials, like 4x minus 5 over x minus 2. And we would be much better served if that looked like this. Because then we know it's a regular rational function that's moved to the right 2 and up 4. And instead of 1 over x, we're doing 3 over x, okay, vertically expanded by 3. But how do we get here? Okay, so first thing we want to do is we want to change the numerator so you can factor out whatever the denominator is from the first two terms. So I want to be able to factor out x minus 2 from my first two terms. So I'm going to actually create a second term. And you see that over here. I subtracted an 8 and I added an 8 to the numerator. That meant that when I factored the 4 out of these first two terms, I was left with 4 over x minus 2. Or not 4 over, but 4 times x minus 2. The plus 8 minus 5 gave me plus 3. Now if I write this as two pieces, where I've got 4 times x minus 2 over the denominator, plus 3 over the denominator, then my x minus 2's cancel, and I'm left with 4 plus 3 over x minus 2, or... 3 over x minus 2 plus 4, which becomes easy to graph. Some tote moves to the right 2, and up 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. I didn't bother with the other portion of this graph, only because it would be up here somewhere, but uh, identical to what we were doing before. All right, so here's another one, <clears throat> and I think you guys should try to do this one first. Remember, you want to set up the numerator, where you can factor out or, um, the leading coefficient here of 2 and be left with an x minus 4 plus some other stuff. So what do you have to add in here so that 2 times x, which is 2x, and 2 times negative 4 is a clue. You try it and then uh, pause the video and then come in and check again. You'll have 2x, that's like 2 times x, which is 2x, and 2 times negative 4, which would be negative 8, coincidentally, same value as before. But whatever I do to 1, I have to counteract that. So if I subtract 8, I have to add 8, and then plus 2, <coughs> excuse me, over x minus 4. If I factor the 2 out of these two terms, I'll get 2 times x minus 4, plus 8 plus 2, which is plus 10, over x minus 4 break that up into two parts and I get 2 times x minus 4 over x minus 4 plus 10 over x minus 4. The x minus 4 is cancel and I'm left with 2 plus 10 over x minus 4 or y equals 10 over x minus 4 plus 